So what is today? It's Reformation Sunday. Is today actually the 500th anniversary of the Reformation? No, somebody said it over here. Say it louder. No. The actual 500th anniversary of the Reformation is in two days. Right? Because technically, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Church door on October 31st in 1517. And why did he do this? To start a what? Debate. To start a debate, right? He wanted to debate some stuff. And why did he come to the conclusion that things about the denomination that he was working in, which was what? The Roman Catholic Church. It was the Roman Catholic Church at that point. Had some issues. And he wanted to work through them. And how did he come to this? Something that every one of us should be doing every day. He did what? He Say it. They can't hear you back there. And I know you can talk louder than that. <laughs> Martin Luther read his Bible and the truths that he found therein changed the world because he was bold enough to, to put up a proclamation of, of theses to start a discussion. And the reason it became the Protestant Reformation was because a few years earlier, the printing press had been developed. Right? Right? The technology of the day took over. And his students knew what it was when Luther posted this set of theses or questions or statements in Latin on the church door in Wittenberg to have a discussion about them. And they took them and they translated them and they put them out into the hands of the people. Which isn't what Luther intended at all. But that's what happened. So Luther read his Bible. And because of that, you're here this morning wearing red. And you're here this morning reading these lessons from Jeremiah and Romans and John that never get... The lesson from John that never gets read any other Sunday. It's only ever in the lectionary on Reformation Sunday. And it's only if you're in a congregation that celebrates the Reformation. <coughs> But it's a powerful text, and it speaks to our ten young people, who hopefully will get confirmed this morning. No one has answered my question correctly yet, though, so I'm still waiting for a correct answer to the question. <laughs> but what does this reading from John have to do with us? And with the confirmation students, right? What does it have? What can we glean from this? Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. If you continue in my word, some of you might have different Bibles and different translations. Another way to say this is Jesus said, if you remain in my word, you are truly my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We continue in God's word, remain in God's word. For the visitors, I, I normally give the, the members here a lesson in Greek most Sunday mornings. So the word here is actually in Greek is meno, not meno for you fishers, fishermen out there, not minnows, meno, meno, which means to abide or dwell with really means abide so if you abide in my word and what does it mean to abide believe. to believe kind of it's a little bit more than that though jesus abides with us i equate it to to the old testament when it said that that Jesus, that they, um, when they were on the mountain, not the old, it is the Old Testament when God tented with his people, right? They went out into the wilderness and he stayed with them. And then in the New Testament, we get Jesus came and tented with or dwelt with. He remained with us wherever we went, right? When, when Peter was up on the mountaintop with Jesus 
and he met Elijah and Moses, he built three dwelling places or abiding places. He dwelt three places for them to stay together. Right? It's about staying with Jesus. If you stay with me and you continue to be in my word, then you will truly know my truth and my truth will set you free. And what is their answer? What should their answer be? Praise Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But what do they say? It's right there in black and white. Right. We're, we are children descendants of Abraham and we've never been slaves to anyone. Short term memory loss. We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. Really? Did you somehow forget about Egypt or the Assyrians or the Persians? Or how about take a look around you right now, folks, because when Jesus said this to these people, they were under occupation and slavery by the Romans. But we've never been slaves to anybody, right? Because Jesus sets us free. Confirmation students, listen to this. He sets us free. And what does freedom mean? Freedom means I get to do whatever I want, right? No, <laughs> it doesn't. Freedom is not about getting your way and getting what you want all the time, right? When Jesus sets us free, it's something much deeper than that. It's something much bolder than that. It's something much more beautiful than that, which I seen through every one of those projects out there. Because you get it. And that has nothing to do with me. It has more to do with your parents than anything else. Because you've learned over the past 14 years to live in faith that your parents have shown you. And you've learned over the 14 years that it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to make mistakes. Parents, just hang with me for a minute. It'll be all okay in the end, I promise. <laughs> it's okay to do things wrong. It's okay to mess up big time. Because just like God, your parents are always going to be there to pick you up, to dust you off, and to help you back on your track. To help you back on your way. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling us this morning. Right? Because none of us are really different than the, than the Israelites, the disciples that Jesus was talking to this, that morning. Right? Because all of us want freedom our own way. We're not any different than them. We have short-term memory loss on all of the bad things that happen in our life when everything's going good. And when it's not, we want to turn to Jesus and have him make everything right. But we can't do that. We have to live with Jesus all the time. We have to admit when things aren't right. We can't put on a false facade of everything being great and wonderful when we know that it's not. I talked last week about a, a, a survey that was done about high school, high school students and college students who on social media always put the good stuff. They never put the bad stuff. And that's proven fact that people always put up this great shiny life on social media and and we think that everything's perfect, even though when we look at it, we know that it's not. And as we look at those pictures, you think to yourself, God, my life must be crap because it's nothing like any of this, even though it's all a facade. Right. That's all people do is put out a false facade of who they are and how great everything is. It's OK for you to say my life isn't going OK right now and I need somebody to help me. It's okay for us to admit that we don't have everything together. It's okay for us to admit that, hey, you know what? I'm not perfect and I've messed things up before. Because that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to live real in a world to show them that life is not always this candy coated picture of perfectness, but that in and out of everything that happens, even in the darkest valleys, that God is always going to be with us. Right? Right? There's several people in this gathering right now that are going through things that people don't know anything about. And I'm not saying that that's wrong for us to keep things from other people. But sometimes those of you that have shared those things know 
that it helps to have other people there with you, to walk with you through these times, to help you to see those things. And confirmation students, this isn't the end, right? When you come up here in a few minutes and you get confirmed. What, no cheering for that? I just said you're going to get confirmed. (laughs) That's not the end of the process. That's not the end of the race. Because this race is something that we run every day. And we need the help of everybody around us. We need the help of our brothers and sisters. And someone out there is going to need you. God wants us to abide. He wants us to remain. He wants us to be with Him always. Luther wrote his 95 theses and nailed them to the Wittenberg church door. And can anybody tell me what they are? (laughs) Go read them. They're out there on the wall really, really quick. You could go read them if you can see that. It's really tiny print. The first of Luther's 95 thesis is about repentance. It's about us understanding that we can't do this on our own, that we need God's help, right? Luther said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. We're not all that big on repentance, but some of that might be our confusion about what that actually means. Right? We don't understand what it means to repent. Luther goes on to say that by repentant, he's actually not simply talking about confession and penance as administrated by the clergy, which is thesis number two, or an inward cathartic kind of feeling about feeling really bad about what we've done, which is thesis number three. Rather, true repentance for Luther is a kind of truth telling that allows us to be honest about who we are deceiving ourselves. And letting ourselves be deceived by the world, or maybe both of those. And that gives us an opportunity to think and to speak differently and to act differently. Or in another way, it allows us to live in the freedom that Christ gives us. So if we can admit we can't do it on our own, and that we need the help of everyone around us, that's how you're going to move forward in life. It's not about doing this by yourselves about doing this with the help of those around you. And if you think you don't have anybody around you, just take a look. There's a lot more people in these pews this morning than there normally is. And it's not because they came to listen to me talk. It's because they're here for the ten of you. Right? Because they love you and they support you and they want you to do well in life. And that's what God wants for you too. God wants you to abide with Him, to tell Him that you can't do it on your own, and to simply trust and to put your life into His hands. And if you do that, I promise you that life will be greater than you could ever possibly imagined. But it'll be nothing that you ever imagined it would be. Because He'll take you on a ride, and it'll be the best ride you've ever been on. So trust Him and go into the world prepared to meet it face to face and share the love that He's given you.